white silence. Mason spat out a piece of ice and, looking sadly at the poor animal, said, Carmen won't last more than two days. Then he took the animal's foot in his mouth to break the cruelly frozen ice between its toes. After finishing his task and pushing the animal aside, he said, I've never seen animals with fancy names be of any use. The moment they face a bit of hardship, they give up the ghost. Have you ever seen dogs with sensible names like Cassiar, Siwash, or Husky behave like that? No, sir. Just take a look at Shockham here. Suddenly, the frail animal lunged, its teeth passing just beside Mason's throat. Going to bite me, are you? With the handle of his whip, he struck the dog behind its ear, causing it to collapse into the snow with a faint growl, drooling. As I was saying, just look at Shokum. Now that's what I call an animal. If he doesn't eat Carmen by the end of the week, I'll eat my hat. Turning over the bread they had placed by the fire to Thor, Malamut Kid said, If you ask me, we'll be eating Shokum before our journey ends. What do you think, Ruth? The Indian woman stirred the coffee with a piece of ice, looked at Malamut Kid, her husband, and then at the dogs, but said nothing. It was such a palpable truth that it needed no response. They only had enough food for six days on the 200 mile journey ahead of them. The woman and the two men circled around the fire and began their meager meal. During the noon break, the dogs lay with their harnesses still on, eyeing every bite with envy. From today on, no more lunch breaks, said Malamut Kid, and we need to keep an eye on the dogs. They're getting more irritable. If they get the chance, they'll take us down. I used to teach Sunday school at church, Mason said, sinking into reverie as he examined his steaming moccasins. Thank God, we've got plenty of tea. I saw tea growing in Tennessee once. What I wouldn't give for a hot bowl of corn chowder right now. Never mind, Ruth. My hunger and my need for moccasins won't last much longer. Upon hearing this, the woman forgot her own sorrow and a look of affection settled in her eyes for this first white man she had ever seen. Her white master, who treated a woman as something more than just a simple beast of burden. Her husband continued speaking in that mixed language only they could understand. Yes, Ruth, just hold on until we get out of here. We'll board the white man's boat and go to the salt water. Yes, the bad waters, the rough waters, the great mountains rise and fall there. They're so big, so far away. You travel 10 sleeps, 20 sleeps, 40 sleeps. He tried to count the days on his fingers. All water, all bad water. Then you reach a big village where there are many people, as many as next summer's mosquitoes. Their houses are so tall, 10 pines, 20 pines tall. He kum. He paused in despair and looked pleadingly at Malamut Kid. Then he gestured, stacking 20 imaginary pines on top of each other. Malamut Kid smiled mockingly, but Ruth's eyes were wide open, filled with both admiration and joy. She believed they were mocking her, and the very fact that they had attempted such a thing filled her heart with a strange satisfaction. Then you get into a, a box, and puff, you go up. To demonstrate, the man tossed his empty cup into the air and skillfully caught it as it fell. And puff, you go down. Ah, oh, great Dr. Men. You go to Fort Yukon. I go to Arctic City. A full 25 sleeps, and there's a long rope along the way. I grab the rope and say, How are you, Ruth? And you say, Is this my good husband? I say, Yes. You say, I can't make good bread. We're out of soda. And I say, Look under the flour sack. Goodbye. You look there and find the soda. While we're talking, you're in Fort Yukon, and I'm in Arctic City. Hi, you Dr. Men. Ruth smiled so innocently at this fairy tale that both men burst into laughter. A fight broke out among the dogs, interrupting the wonderful stories of the outside world. Once the growling animals had been separated, Ruth had already hitched the sleds. Everything was ready for the journey. Come on, Baldy! Mason skillfully cracked his whip and broke the ice that had formed around the sled with his stick as the dogs began to growl. Ruth was driving the second sled with Malamut Kid, who had helped her get started, following behind. Although Malamut Kid was strong and fierce enough to knock out an ox with a single punch, he couldn't bring himself to beat the poor animals. In a behavior rarely seen in a sled driver, he tried to coax them along, even weeping with them in their misery. After a series of futile efforts to get the sled moving, he murmured, come on, 
Come on, let's go, you poor creatures with sore feet. But in the end, his patience prevailed. And despite their groaning in pain, the dogs began to run to catch up with their companions. There was no more talking. The harshness of the trail did not allow for such extravagance. Among all the deadly paths, the Northland Trail is the worst. A man who can cross a well-trodden path in a single day without speaking is a fortunate man. And the most disheartening task of all is to cross an untouched path. With each step, the broad snowshoe sinks into the snow until it reaches the knee. Then, the foot must be lifted straight up until it rises above the snow level. Otherwise, even the slightest slip could spell disaster. And while pressing forward and down, the other foot must be lifted half a metre straight up. Anyone trying this for the first time, unless they happen to place their snowshoes too close together and fall flat on the trail, will abandon the effort completely exhausted after just a hundred metres. A man who can go ahead of the dogs all day without mishap can crawl into his sleeping bag with a clear conscience and a sense of pride beyond understanding, and the gods themselves envy the man who has travelled 20 sleeps along the long trail. It was nearing afternoon, and the silent travellers had turned their attention to their tasks filled with the fear born of the white silence. Nature has many ways to convince a man of his mortality. The endless flow of rivers, the terror of the storm, the earthquake, the thunder, but the most terrifying the most astonishing of all is the passivity of the white desolation. All movement ceases, the sky clears, the heavens are like bronze, the slightest whisper seems like an assault on all that is sacred. The man, frightened by the sound of his own voice, becomes timid. As the only speck of life travelling through this vast dead world, he trembles before his own audacity, realising that his life is worth no more than that of a worm. Unknowingly, strange thoughts arise and the mysteries of all things struggle to be expressed. And then comes the fear of death, the fear of God, the fear of the universe, the hope of resurrection and life, the longing for immortality, and the futile struggles of the captive soul. And only then does man walk with God. The day passed in this way. As the river curved broadly, Mason steered his dogs towards a shortcut but the dogs hesitated before a steep slope, and despite Ruth and Malamut Kid pushing from behind, the sled slid back repeatedly. Then they combined their efforts. The poor creatures, exhausted from hunger, expended their last bit of energy. The sled slowly made its way to the top of the slope, but just as the lead dog suddenly veered to the right, Mason's snowshoes became entangled. The result was disastrous. Mason fell to the ground. One of the dogs tumbled in its harness and the sled, dragging everything with it, slid back down the slope. Crack! The whip lashed out among the dogs, especially the one that had fallen. Don't do it, Mason, pleaded Malamut Kid. The poor animal is on its last legs. Let's put mine in front. Mason held his whip until the final word was spoken. Then the long leather thong snapped out, wrapping around the guilty dog's body. It was Carmen, Carmen the dog who collapsed into the snow with a pitiful cry, then rolled to the side and lay still. It was a tragic moment, a sorrowful event of the journey, a dog about to die, two friends in a rage. Ruth looked anxiously from one to the other, but despite the reproach in his eyes, Malamut Kid restrained himself, bending over the dog to cut the straps. They had not spoken. The dogs were rehitched, and the sleds moved on. The wounded dog was being dragged along behind them. As long as an animal could walk, it was not killed. It was given one last chance. The animal would follow the team to the camp in the hope of catching a moose. Mason, already regretting his angry action, but too stubborn to admit his mistake, led the caravan forward. Unaware of the looming danger, they were traveling through thick trees. About 50 meters ahead, a majestic pine tree towered over the path. It had stood there for generations, and perhaps fate had prepared this end for it through the ages. And perhaps the same had been decreed for Mason. Mason paused to tie the loose lace of his moccasin. The sleds halted. The dogs lay silently in the snow. There was a mysterious stillness. Not a breath of wind stirred in the icy forest. The cold and silence of the outer world had frozen the heart of nature and stilled its trembling lips. 
sigh seemed to be heard, like the premonition of movement in the motionless void. They felt it more than they heard it. The great tree, weighed down by years and snow, played its final role in the drama of life. As Mason straightened up to leap aside at the sound of the cracking warning, he felt the blow strike his shoulder while he was almost upright. Sudden danger, swift death. Malamut Kid had faced this many times. By the time he began giving orders and taking action, the needles of the pine were still quivering. The Indian woman did not faint like many of her white sisters, nor did she waste her voice on useless cries. At Malamut Kid's command, she immediately leaned on a makeshift lever, slightly easing the pressure on her husband's body and listening to his groans. Meanwhile, Malamut Kid attacked the tree with his axe. The steel bit into the frozen trunk with a cheerful sound, and each stroke was accompanied by a barely audible breath, the woodsman's ha 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 sound. Finally, Kid laid this once human pitiful creature in the snow, but the silent sorrow on the woman's face, that mixture of both hope and despair, was worse than her companion's suffering. Not much was said. Northerners learn at a young age the futility of words and the incalculable value of actions. At 30 degrees below zero, it is impossible for a man to lie in the snow for several minutes and continue to live. Therefore, the sled was unhitched and the injured man was wrapped in furs and laid among the branches. A fire lit from the tree that caused the accident burned in front of him. Behind and above him hung a piece of canvas, partially reflecting the warmth. People who share their beds with death know when their time has come. Mason had been horribly crushed. A cursory examination immediately revealed this. His right arm, right leg and spine were broken. His legs were paralyzed from the hips down and it was highly likely that his internal organs were damaged. The occasional groan he made was the only sign of life. There was neither hope nor anything to be done. The merciless night descended slowly. Ruth's fate, the hopeless patience of her race, and the new lines etched on Malamut Kid's bronze face. In fact, at that moment, Mason, who was mentally revisiting scenes from his childhood, wandering through the Great Smoky Mountains in East Tennessee, was the one among them who suffered the least. The melody of his long-forgotten southern dialect, as he rambled about lakes, hunting and stealing watermelons, was more thrilling than anything else. Kid understood these things that were incomprehensible to Ruth, and he felt them in a way only someone who had been far from everything civilization represents for years could feel. In the morning, when Malamut Kid brought the injured man back to consciousness, he leaned in closer to hear Mason's whispers. Do you remember when we met in Tanana? It'll be four years this winter. I didn't care much for it back then. She was so beautiful then and I suppose that made it exciting too. But you know, I realize her worth now. She was a good wife to me. Whenever I was in trouble, I found her by my side. Especially when it came to trade, there was no one like her, you know? Do you remember the days of famine in Nukluk Yeto, and how she ran to deliver the news before the winter set in? Yes, she was a good wife to me, a better wife than my other one. You didn't know I'd been married before, did you? I never told you, did I? Well, I tried once while back home. That's why I'm here now. We grew up together. I came here to give her the chance to get a divorce. And she did. But this has nothing to do with Ruth. I was planning to go back to America next winter with Ruth, but now it's too late. Don't send her back to her family, kid. It's hard for a woman to go back. Just think, she's been living on our sausage, beans, flour, and dried fruit for four years. And now how could she return to fish and venison? After learning that our ways are more comfortable than those of her own tribe, it wouldn't be good for Ruth to go back there. Take care of her kid, even though, why? But you've always kept your distance from them and you've never told me why you came to this land. Treat her well and when you find a chance, send her to the United States, but let her come back whenever she wants. She might get homesick, especially the little one. He brought us even closer together, kid. I hope he's a boy. Just think, kid, a part of me. He shouldn't stay in this land, especially if it's a girl. She definitely can't stay. Sell my furs. They're worth at least $5,000. And there's another 5,000 at the company. 
Work my mining shares along with yours. My son should get a good education, kid. And most importantly, never let him return here. This place isn't fit for whites. I'm a dead man, kid. I've got three or four sleeps left. You must continue on. You must continue on. Remember, she's my wife, my child. Oh God, I want him to be a boy so much. You can't stay with me. I command you. The one who's about to die commands you to continue on. Continue on. Malamut kid pleaded. Give me three days. Maybe you'll get a little better. Maybe something will happen. No, just three days. You must continue on. Two days. She's my wife and child, kid. You shouldn't ask this. One day. No, no, you. Just one day. We can ration the food and maybe I can hunt a deer. No, all right, but not a minute more. And kid, don't ever leave me alone. Just one touch on the trigger. You understand, don't you? Just think, think. A part of me and I won't get to see it. Send Ruth here. I want to say goodbye to her. Tell her to think of our child and not wait for me to die. If I don't, she might not want to go with you. Goodbye, my friend. Goodbye. Kid leaned in to hear Mason's last words. The fading pride of the dying man. Forgive me. I'm so sorry. For Carmen. You understand, don't you? Leaving the woman to weep beside her husband, Malamut Kid put on his parka and snowshoes, tucked his rifle under his arm and walked into the woods. He wasn't unfamiliar with the great sorrows of the North, but he had never faced a situation as difficult as this. When taken abstractly, it was a simple matter of calculation. Three lives possibly saved against one doomed to die. But now he hesitated. For five years, they had faced death together, shoulder to shoulder, on rivers, in the snow, in camps, mines, floods and famines, building bonds of friendship between them. These bonds were so tight that he had even felt a vague jealousy of Ruth when she first joined them. Now he had to sever this bond with his own hands. Even though he prayed for just one deer, it was as if all the animals had deserted the forest. The exhausted man returned to camp empty-handed and heavy-hearted as night fell, hastening when he heard the dogs barking and Ruth screaming. When he entered the camp, he found Ruth among the growling dogs with an axe in hand. The dogs had broken the iron rule of their masters and attacked the provisions. He joined the fight with the butt of his rifle. The rifle and axe rose and fell, escaping or striking in a steady rhythm. Man and beast fought for the superiority that would bring the most bitter outcome. In the end, the defeated animals retreated to the edge of the firelight, licking their wounds and howling their pain to the stars. The entire stock of dried fish had been consumed, leaving them with only two or three pounds of flour for food in a 200-mile wilderness. As Malamut Kid cut up the warm carcass of a dog with a shattered skull, Ruth returned to her husband's side. She carefully set aside the parts of the dead animal that weren't useful, except for the hide thrown in front of its companions. In the morning, they faced new difficulties. The animals had begun attacking each other. The others had already brought down Carmen, who was still alive. They didn't heed the whip. They howled and moaned under the blows. They didn't disperse until every last bit of bone, hide and hair was gone. Malamut Kid returned to work, listening to Mason, who was once again in Tennessee. He began working hastily, taking advantage of the nearby pines. Ruth saw that he was making a cache, similar to what hunters sometimes use to protect their meat from dogs and wolves. He had bent two small pine trees to the ground and tied them together with straps. Then he beat the dogs into harnesses on two sleds, loading everything but the furs covering Mason onto the sleds. After tightly wrapping the furs around Mason, he tied them to the two trees. With a single slash of the knife, the trees would be released and Mason's body would be flung into the air. Ruth didn't resist, knowing her husband's last wishes. The poor woman had learned her lesson well. Since childhood, she'd submitted to these superior masters and had seen that all women did the same. It wasn't a woman's job to resist them. Kid had allowed her to kiss her husband to express her grief. There was no such custom in her tribe then led her to the front sled and helped her put on her snowshoes. Ruth, blindly, unconsciously, took the whip in her hand and moved the dogs. 
Kid returned to Mason's side, who had fallen back into a coma and sat by the fire, waiting for his friend's death, hoping for it, praying for it. Long after Ruth had disappeared from sight, it is not pleasant to be left alone with painful thoughts in the white silence. The silence of grief is gentle. It wraps around you like it's protecting you and murmurs a thousand comforting words that cannot be understood. But that cold, clear and bright white silence under the grey skies is merciless. An hour, two hours passed, and the man still wasn't dead. At noon, the sun briefly rose above the southern horizon, casting a shadow of fire into the sky before quickly retreating. Malamut Kid stood up and went to his friend's side. He glanced around. The white silence seemed to be mocking him. Suddenly, a great fear seized him. A blast was heard. Mason was flung into the air. Malamut Kid whipped the dogs furiously until they were racing away through the snow. 